Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to episode 35 of Who Gives a Dram. Um, before we get into the episode, we're going to take care of a little bit of business. Um, if you're not already following the podcast, make sure you're following on Instagram at Who Gives a Dram. Make sure you are following uh, or subscribed on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you listen to your podcasts or watch your podcasts, we're probably on there. So if this is your first time listening, um, if you're on YouTube, throw me a subscription or a subscribe, uh, throw the video a like. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you rate the uh, you rate the podcast uh, five stars. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And um, if you're listening on any other podcast platform, do the same thing. Um, also, as well, make sure uh, not only Instagram, um, your boy is active on TikTok. So make sure you're following Who Gives a Dram on TikTok. And... Um, also on Facebook, I, I post my videos on Facebook too. So that's all at who gives a dram. Um, if you guys want to use the whiskey glasses that I use every single week on the podcast, they're the most durable, um, nosing and tasting glasses that I have seen. And not only are they durable, not only are they stainless steel, but they're also very sleek and modern looking. Check out Snoot Glass. Uh, www.snootglass.com for their full product lineup and once you guys are ready to buy said product put in the promo code wg8020 at checkout and you will get 20 percent off your entire order also check out uh the grapevine media.com the grapevine media presents this podcast www.thegrapevinemedia.com Dot com. Lots of blogs being pumped out. Lots of lots of content being pushed. Brand new merch in our merch store. So go check that out. www.thegrapevinemedia.com. So with the business out of the way, you guys, let's jump right into the whiskey this week. First, I want to say, you know, I hope everyone had a great week. Um, it was definitely an eventful week for me. Um, I, I went into this to this episode knowing I had a lot to talk about. And typically I try to write down notes and I try to prepare a little bit for the show. But this week I said, you know what, we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants and and we're going to jump right into it. So um, I'm recording this episode a little bit late, a little bit later than I do, because there are there is some events that happened this weekend that I wanted to react to. Um, and I I chose my whiskey appropriately as well. Um, this week's whiskey is going to be peerless straight rye whiskey um this was gifted to me and it's a very generous gift because this is usually msrping at around a hundred dollars this is a two year old barrel proof rye whiskey distilled and bottled by peerless um in um in kentucky this specific bottle is 107.2 or uh 53.6 percent abv 107.2 proof um it is Bottle R1504063031. Um, it's a two year old barrel proof rye whiskey. And it's um it's it's uh it's distilled by um a very historic distilling company in Peerless. Uh Peerless was one of those distilleries that was very popular in the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, went out of business due to um prohibition for the most part, but came back uh, started distilling their own stuff, and I believe in 2017 they won um, they won uh, one of the f- top 15 best whiskeys in the world, maybe um, on Whiskey Advocate or something like that. But it's actually a sweet mash whiskey, which is kind of cool. Um, typically, bourbons are sour mash, um, and I didn't know the difference, so I went on to bourbonveach.com. And it says that uh, yeast like an acidic or sour environment, but bacteria does not. By quote unquote souring the mash, it creates an environment that is fa- favorable to the yeast, but not to the bacteria. So that's why typically this sour mash uh, process is is so popular. However, um, Peerless, according to this website, is so confident in their cleaning abilities and the state of their of their facility that. Uh, they go with the sweet mash, um, and essentially what the sweet mash is, if I have it right, is is they they don't double the mash. Like they don't they don't um, 
bring it over from what am i trying to say it's i was just reading it here i don't really know what it is <laughs> something i never heard of i said it on the bottle i was like i should probably know what this is um Yeah, I wish it would just say, what is sour, what is sweet mash? You know, I'm just going to search it. What is sweet mash? Yeah, it's not even saying what it is. A sweet mash. There it is. A, a sweet mash, what the hell? A sweet mash is simply mash with no back set, the term which defines the spent mash or slop added to the beer in the sour mash method or other pH adjustments made via citric acid, malic acid, or malolactic bacteria. Sweet mash begins fermentation as nothing more than the yeast working away at a fresh batch of beer or wine to be distilled. As you will see, nothing is ever as simple as this definition makes it appear to be. Okay, then it gets into the history. Not going to go into that. Um... Regardless, it's a sweet mash. It's two years old. It's barrel proof. It was gifted to me. I've had it a few times. The last time I had this was watching the WandaVision finale, and um, I haven't had it since. So I'm excited to uh, review it on the podcast uh, here today. Um, and I chose this whiskey because I wanted something strong. I wanted something barrel proof, and I wanted something out of the ordinary just to 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 uh, to uh, dampen my. Um, or maybe to subdue my sorrows from this past weekend. Uh, the reason I'm recording so late is because this weekend was the Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier card, and I have some things to say about it. Um, as you guys probably know, I'm a, I'm a big Conor McGregor fan. Um, I've talked about his fight, uh, his first fight with um, Dustin Poirier, uh, on the Four Roses small batch episode, so go back to that episode to check out my my reaction from that fight. I break down that fight um, in pretty pretty good detail, and I was very excited for this fight. I was looking forward to it. I knew it was going to happen as soon as he lost the second fight, and I think everybody had different opinions as to what was going to happen. Is Conor McGregor washed? Is he hungry? Did the money get to him, or is the old Conor back? And he's going to make another run through the lightweight division and uh, beat Dustin Poirier, similar to how he beat uh, Nate Diaz in in the rematch there. So I suppose the first thing to say is that Dustin Poirier is really good. And there's no one more deserving of that win in the lightweight division than Dustin Poirier. And I love Dustin Poirier. He's one of my favorite fighters. And he deserves it. He deserves the fame he's getting. He deserves the money. He deserves the fact that his foundation is getting the spotlight. And, you know, he deserves everything he's getting. Um, but the thing is, I don't think Conor McGregor is washed. I don't think he's... I don't think he's... Uh, he cannot win high-level fights anymore. And the fact that people are saying that he cannot win at a high level that he's done, that the money got to him, I just don't agree with. Listen, the first round of the fight, yes, McGregor lost it. Was it a 10-8 round? No, it was not. It was not a 10-8 round. I don't understand why two judges had it as a 10-8 round because it wasn't. The, the term 10-8 round is getting thrown around so loosely now. Back when I started watching MMA, you never saw a 10-8 round, and now you see it all the time. So that's kind of... Um, sketchy to see so many 10-8 rounds but McGregor lost the round he looked good on the feet he looked all right on the feet um obviously attempted that half-ass guillotine uh, probably shouldn't have gone to the floor with it however he was working from the bottom he really didn't get clipped on the ground and pound he did get a few good elbows to the face but that's what happens when Dustin Poirier is on top of you raining down elbows some of them are going to come through but it didn't look like he got hurt, didn't look like he got phased. Um, and as as we all know, when they got back up, the, the tibia and fibia just gave out, and that was the end of the fight. TKO win for Dustin Poirier round one. And that's just the way it's, it is. That's just the way it is now. That's uh, It's going to go down in the record books as a, as a knockout win 
or a doctor stoppage win for Dustin Poirier, and that's that's okay because it's Dustin Poirier. He was winning the fight to the point. I don't know what would happen but, uh, after that round, but um, me being a full-fledged Conor McGregor supporter, I think uh, I like to think Conor McGregor was prepared to go all five, so we would have seen a... a, a uh, it looked like we were, we were in the beginning stages of seeing a very good fight. And in terms of all, everything Conor McGregor said after, listen, everything is fair game in 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 the fight game, uh, in my opinion. So bringing the wives into it, although not ideal, I think it's fair game. Um, I think I also think that the fact that his leg was shattered. Um, the shock that the guy was probably in and the things that he was saying, it might have just been all impulse or or maybe he didn't even know he was saying it. Um, with 20,000 people screaming, knowing that he just lost a... He just illegitimately lost a fight. Um, knowing the the reper, reper, repercussions of that result, people were going to be doubting him. I don't... I don't really blame him for saying what he said. I think he was upset. I think he was in shock. I think he was kind of just numb and was saying anything and everything that he was thinking of. And in the future, I think we're going to see this fight again. I don't think it'll be for a while, but I do think Conor McGregor's the type of guy that he's not going to let that, he's not going to let himself go out on that foot. No pun intended. (laughs) But... He'll definitely come back and fight. I would imagine Dustin Poirier. And who knows? Dustin Poirier beats Charles Oliveira for the belt. Conor McGregor comes back. He could be fighting for a title. We we don't know. It very well could happen. He could definitely be fighting for a title very soon. And that's just the way the UFC is. Conor McGregor, they did a reported 1.8 million buys. Second largest uh, pay-per-view in UFC history. Probably generated over 100 million for the night. If you if you're consistently doing that, which Conor McGregor's doing, then then not everything's fair game. I mean, listen, he still has a case to being a top top lightweight. He did not lose that fight. Technically, yes, he lost the fight due to a doctor stoppage. But everyone who's saying that Dustin Poirier was going to win regardless, it's a legitimate win. I don't agree with that. I think those are people more upset with the fact that Conor McGregor was turning into an asshole with his trash talking. But again, that's the nature of the fight game. I don't like how Dustin Poirier was saying, "Oh, I was I you know, you don't tell someone you're going to you're going to kill them in the octagon." Um I I don't understand his logic between with being mad at that because people say that all the time. Um I have, I have a lot of emotions about the fight as you can tell. My mouth's getting dry talking about him. Had to let that out on the podcast. I know this isn't a fighting podcast, but um it is what it is, you guys. Oh, well, there's no there's no barrel pop. There's no cork pop this week because this cork is not. Cork is not good. But that's where we're at this week, you guys. Conor McGregor lost and probably the worst way he could. Even a clean loss would have been better. Like a clean knockout or submission or decision probably would have been easier to sit with. But now the uncertainty of this decision is just... It sucks, but I'm a Conor McGregor guy. I will be till to the end, so um, I'm rooting for him to come back. I think he will come back better than ever, and I'll be here to talk about it on the podcast when he does. Um, so that was the big event of the weekend. That's why I, I decided to record a little bit later. Um, other than that, I uh, was able to go back to the movies this week, which was cool. Um, went to go see Black Widow in theaters. The first time uh, I've been in theaters in probably a year and a half. And it was cool to see an MCU movie in theaters again. And I really liked Black Widow. I thought it was really good. Um, I I am obviously a big Marvel uh, fan. I talk about it quite a bit on the podcast. And it was a very, very, it was basically, it was basically chick, Winter Soldier, but chicks. Um, if you've seen Captain America Winter Soldier, then basically you've seen Black Widow. But I'm not complaining about that because Winter Soldier is one of my favorite MCU movies. So I wouldn't say that Black Widow is on a bottom tier 
MCU level. It's probably a tier above. I compare it to Iron Man 1, and I I think it's a little bit better than Iron Man 1, but not as good as Spider-Man Homecoming. Like, it's in that range of, like, movies, MCU movies that you would watch again, but nothing that blows your socks off. However, I do think it was an above-average movie. I was thoroughly entertained. I loved David Harbour. Harbor, uh, Hopper from Stranger Things. He played the Red Guardian. He was amazing in it. He was hilarious, and it was just a fun, um, a fun movie. And it was even better to be back in theaters. So, oh, and I just figured out this week, like a few days ago, that there is a movie theater opening up in walking distance from my apartment. So, I'm infamous for going to the movies by myself. So. Um, I'm looking forward to doing that because <laughs> I can now I can go watch a movie and then walk for a little bit further down the street to the cigar bar, smoke cigar, come home. I can do that on like a Friday night when I'm chilling by myself because I have no friends. <sighs> Wish I was joking. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, um, that's, that was basically the weekend for me. Um, that's why I'm, we're drinking Peerless today, because I needed something to drown out the sorrow. Oh. And I hope everyone else had a great weekend, because I truly did enjoy... I w- well, I wish, I wish the weather was better, but I truly did enjoy going to the movies again, and I truly did enjoy getting uh, being able to get together with some buddies and watching the McGregor fight. Um it's always good getting together with those that you like to be around. So, a little bit about Peerless. Let's go into the uh, actual distillery. Um, I had a so we already went into the specs of this bottle. It's MSRP is around a hundred bucks. Um, again, one hundred seven point two proof, fifty three point six percent alcohol. So this is a hitter. It's a rye whiskey. Not the biggest rye guy. But I'm always willing to give it a chance. There are some ryes that I really like. Um, and right, where is this? Uh, right, all right. And so I'm not really the biggest rye guy, but um, we've done some ryes on the podcast. And you know what? I like rye. It's whiskey. I like whiskey. Um a little bit about Peerless. Peerless, founded in 1889 by pharmacist Henry Craver, was revived in 2014 by his great-great-grandson, Corky Taylor, all-time name, Corky Taylor, love that, and Corky's son, Carson. Corky and Carson, you guys. We're drinking Corky and Carson's whiskeys this week. Um, love to have Corky Taylor on the podcast. What a name. Uh, They were one of the first distilleries to obtain an original distilled spirits plant number when reopening operating under DSP KY-50. One of the family's first hires was Kilburn, an eastern Kentucky dairy farm boy who was then working on his chemistry degree at Moorhead State University. Um, Before the ground floor, master distiller Caleb Kilburn. So he's the master distiller. Painted on the wall at Kentucky Peerless is the statement, Strictly Sweet Mash. In the 19th century, early distillers used sour mashing to ensure a consistent batch of whiskey every time. It involves using a bit of the setback spent grain or starter from a prior cook to give the next batch a boost in fermentation. So there's a correct definition of sour mash. Um, granted... Quote, granted that starter will have some bacteria and microorganisms, but by starting with a larger population of a healthier yeast than what was native, you were able to kind of hedge your bets and outcompete any contamination, explains Kilburn. It's similar to using a starter in, in sourdough bread. The process is quite resilient, very hardy, so 150 years ago, it absolutely made sense and it was the best way of doing it. It gets the fermentation going quicker and produces a very standard flavor. So I suppose that's how we can expect this peerless rye to be. It is not standard in nature, seeing that it's two years old, priced at $100, and is barrel strength. So there's nothing standard about this whiskey. 
Um, Peerless Whiskey Awards. I want to see what awards Peerless won because I know it did. Kentucky Peerless Distilling Company's Small Batch Kentucky Straight Bourbon was named Best Kentucky Bourbon at the World Whiskey's Awards on February 11, 2050. Huh. Okay. I didn't think the bourbon won. That's interesting. American Whiskey Magazine is who named them the best bourbon. Uh, here's what I'm thinking of. Peerless Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey receives award from Whiskey Advocate. Whiskey Advocate, out today, this is November 21st, 2017, releases their top 20 whiskeys of 2017, ranking Peerless Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey at number 15. So that's not a bad number. Because Whiskey Advocate is very, very um, prestigious in the whiskey community. So... Now, I haven't looked at any tasting notes or anything either, so we're going into this blind. We're going into this just just moving forward, not knowing anything about it. And right off the bat, I get a lot more um, I get a lot more sugar than I think I typically do on on a rye whiskey. Definitely a hot you can tell it's definitely hot. It's got that signature, like a uh, rye hotness, rye spice on the nose, and it's barrel proof, so it's even more pronounced. But I'm getting a burnt sugar. And that rye spice is, is like a sweeter spice, so, so like a cinnamon. But you can, I don't know what it is. I don't know how I can tell it's young, but it's definitely young. You can just tell. It's so pungent. There is a, a pretty healthy amount of, of uh, like, alcohol vapor in there. So, like, that medicinal smell. Kind of get that a little bit. Give it a little uh, swirly poo here. Oh, by the way, if you guys haven't checked out last week's episode, we did Whiskey with Kin 3 with uh, my brother Kale. Had an Old Forester single barrel barrel strength store pick from Wyoming Package Store. Uh, we reviewed it. We talked a little bit. We kind of, you know, we uh, do as brothers do and and really brutally made fun of each other. Kale, Kale called me fat, I think. Hurt my feelings. But <laughs> go check out that episode if you haven't yet. Yeah, it's very... Not a lot of oak in it. Not a lot of not a lot of strong earthy flavors coming out on the nose. Very much, um, yeah. It's it's kind of a it's it's actually not a bad nose. It's definitely pungent. It's very pungent. But it's definitely got that rye spice. But that I'm getting more sugar than I typically do on a rye nose. I have the uh, tasting notes put pulled up here. I haven't looked at them yet. Oh, the mash bill is at least 51% rye, obviously, because it's rye whiskey. Uh, corn and malted barley, aged in new charred oak barrels for two years. Nose is, uh, this is according to the whiskeyjug.com. Juicy orchard fruit, apple heavy, baking spice, copper, rye bread, honey, nuts, and some vanilla, a tad yeasty. Uh, hmm. I suppose the fruit is there. That baking spice, that rye spice, that's that's very forward. Copper, like a penny. Does This does not smell like a penny. Rye bread. Don't eat rye bread. I'm not sure how that smells. Honey, nuts, and some vanilla. That's actually interesting. Okay, after I got done reading the nose and smelling it and reading and smelling and reading and smelling, you know what I really picked up on the forefront is like a, a baklava smell. Because it's sweet, but it's like a toned down sweet. 
And it's like if you put... Yeah, that's definitely how I get. Because the more I the more I think about it now, the honey's there. It's like a burnt sugar. Because the oak isn't there either. Yeah. Man, like a baklava smell from it. Ever smelled baklava? Baklava is like a Greek dessert. Made with dough and honey and nuts, and that's really good. Yeah, that's yeah. The honey and nuts definitely there. Um, this is an unusual nose because it's so young, so you're not really getting oak, and you're getting more alcohol vapors. But it's very interesting at the same time. I'm surprised at how sweet the smell is right off the bat. Let's see if this is actually worth a hundred bucks. I don't remember. So, cheers, everybody! <clears throat> Thank you for tuning in to another week. Ooh, right down the hatch. First thing first, getting that fruit. It doesn't drink like a barrel proof right off the bat. It is hot, and the, that rye spice is there, but fruit, fruit, fruit on the on the on the palate. A little bit of like a like a maltiness. But I'm getting that that juicy orchard fruit more so on the on the palate than anything that they're saying they get on the nose. It's definitely young. It's not big and bold like other barrel proofs. It's not it's not packing a punch with huge flavor. So that's going to bring down the score, but at the same time, there is a lot of flavor for two years. I wonder if that has anything to do with the sweet mash. But it's got a big finish, hot, that that fruit on, on the forward note, spicier on the back. Uh, that sweetness stays throughout the entire finish. Um... That's all I'm getting. That's all I'm getting. It's also my first sip of whiskey of the day. I'm also just getting home from work, so. Who knows? Maybe the fact that I'm tired is affecting my palate. I'm not getting, uh, I'm not getting in, the biggest thing to me is I'm not getting an influx of flavors. I'm not getting, when I drink a barrel, like when I drink an Elijah Craig barrel proof, when I drink a Booker's, when I drink a rare breed, I'm getting an influx of flavors into my mouth, Okay. I'm getting lots of things into my mouth. <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> this is different. This is definitely hot. It's because it's a rye. It's it's hot. It's it's hot and spicy. It's what they called me in high school. And it's got a big fruit note to it. Sweet fruit. Maybe a dash of cinnamon in there. A little bit of malt. Yeah, that's all I'm getting. It's definitely... It's not hot, it's spicy. It's not hot. For a barrel-proof whiskey, this isn't hot. Let's see what it says. Spice, wood, copper, apple juice, honey, rye bread, copper, and herbal notes. So, yeah, I agree with that. It's definitely spicy, but it's not, it's rye spice. It's not barrel proof spice. It's not that barrel spice. It's not just a big proof hot spice. It's just rye spice, baking spice. It is sweeter, so maybe like a little bit of cinnamon, apple cinnamon, like uh, what are those what are those? What's that cereal called? Um, apple Jacks, kind of like that a little bit, a little bit of a spicier apple flavor to there. Um, not really getting a whole lot of vanilla, but it's this is this is a weird one. I wanted to test myself on the on the on the uh, a few days after the McGregor fight, and I definitely am.
yeah, this is this is just fruit forward, fruit spice. This is apple. This is apple jacks in a bottle. It is good though. I am enjoying it more and more with every sip. Maybe that's because I had a long day, but I don't care. So, um, it's definitely. Although it doesn't pack a punch, you can tell Peerless has a standard of what they want this to taste like. It's very spicy and fruity. Um, although Whiskey Jug is saying that the oak is there, I'm not getting a whole lot of oak. And that's definitely coming from the two-year age statement, I believe. It's, it's got those alcohol vapors, medicinal kind of medicinal wipe type of undertones to it like on the smell and on the taste overall though even though it's a barrel proof it is very pleasant it is very spicy for a rye but it's sweeter than a normal rye it's got that that fruitiness to it that i think is very pleasant the only thing that's going to bring this down on the on the who gives a dram scale is the the price i wouldn't pay 100 bucks for this and I don't even know if I'd pay 80 bucks for this. But with Peerless, you are kind of paying for the quality that they're putting into each whiskey. If This is a two-year whiskey. They're bringing this back after 100 years. Obviously, this is very, very... They Peerless takes this very seriously. They're not sourcing it. They're all producing all whiskey in-house. I know they have a few different variants now. Um... And that has to translate into the price. I don't know if Peerless is considered a smaller distillery by nature. Obviously, compared to Buffalo Trace and to uh, Heaven Hill, it's it's tiny. But they're doing it all in-house, and you have to respect that. And that will go into the price. Um, but that doesn't really matter to me. So... For a hundred bucks, yeah, this is. I would. I just don't think this is a hundred dollar rye. I would have trouble paying a hundred dollars for a rye. Um, although I do like the bottle, although I think it looks cool, and although I do think this is a very solid whiskey, I'm gonna give this like a seven point five because it is good. It is hot, and I do like hot, um, and I do enjoy the fact that the that the sweetness is there. However. A hundred dollars really affects the score, but you know, if you're if you're a rye person, you might really like this. You really might like this. Um, you might love it. I'm just not really a rye person, and a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars. I know very. I know there are bourbons that I like more than this that are a quarter of the price. So, with that being said, seven point five for Peerless Rye. Two-year-old rye whiskey. And that is the final score for the day. Um, I forgot to talk about Loki, but we're not going to talk about it. By this point, the f- season finale was already has already came. Well, no, because this gets released Wednesday morning. And I won't watch Loki till Wednesday night. So next week we'll talk about Loki. And we'll have another whiskey. I don't know what it's going to be yet. Um... But we'll we'll play it by ear. We'll see what happens. Um, we never know how the week's going to go. This whiskey was strictly because of how the week went. I decided I was going to do this whiskey yesterday. Because I had no idea what whiskey I was going to do. Um, next week, I do have, I do have a, an, an idea of what whiskey I'm going to do. Hint, it might be staying in the barrel-proof range. Anyways, you guys, that's going to do it for this week. Make sure you're following the podcast on Instagram at who gives a dram. Make sure you're subscribed on all platforms. Um, if you like the YouTube videos, make sure you throw them a like. Uh, throw a subs- uh, subscribe on there. Um, rate on iTunes. Review on iTunes. Uh, subscribe on iTunes. All that good stuff. And tell a friend about the about the show if you enjoy it. Um, I did. You know, I have been getting some really nice messages recently on Instagram, and um, they mean the world to me. I like when people say that they enjoy my whiskey reviews. Um, because I just try to keep it authentic and I try to keep it like it's a conversation 
with just a, a buddy, even though I'm sitting here by myself in my apartment. Um, but other than that, you guys, that's all for me this week. It's time for me to go. Nick Bossy is going to play me out, Pretty New Diamond, and I'll catch you guys next week. Up in New England, that girl sure loved me. We got together and brought things to life. So I did buy her a pretty new diamond. And asked that sweet woman if she'd be my wife. kind of feeling love songs are made of with that sweet woman spend the rest of my life before she came along I was hurting but at the end of my tunnel I saw no light my heart and I can't keep going. Guess I'll just sit here and get drunk tonight. Vows they meant nothing and she ran to a stranger and with Johnny Walker I'm passing my time. I asked the Lord, what should I do? But I'm too drunk to hear him tonight. So sit with my bottle while Hank Sr. singing. I'm so lonesome I could cry. Back that pretty new diamond that broke my heart a second time. But I got the last laugh when I pawned off her ring, cause I bought me a dime bag and a case of Coors Light. I asked the Lord, oh, what should I do? But I'm too drunk to hear him tonight. So sit with my bottle while Hank Sr. singing. I'm so lonesome I could cry. So sit with my bottle while Hank Sr. singing. I'm so lonesome. Ah, cool.